Hello, everyone. My name is Donald. Great to meet all of you. Hi. All of you here. And if you could share a screen, Donald, yeah. and yep. get to the slides. Yep. That would be perfect. This is um, this is working. Yes, it is. Fantastic. Donald's going to talk about min NPM, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, my name is Donald. I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University, and today I'm going to talk about min NPM, which is a new uh, dependency solver that I've been working on. And here I'm going to mostly um, discuss the exciting opportunities for customizable optimizing dependency solving. And this is joint work with my advisor, Arjun Guha, as well as Todd and Matt from the SPAC team. OK, so let me start first with a um, sort of brief, brief background on the relationship that programmers have with their package manager. So we know that package managers exist for a wide variety of languages. And it's crucial for programmers to have access to these package managers to then conveniently be able to use large ecosystems of open source packages. And, um, and you know, we, I'm sure we all agree that that's really important. That's why we're at this, at this uh, talk, right? Um, for, the purposes of, uh, for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to focus on dependency solving specifically. <clears throat> so let's, let's break this down a little bit more. So let, we have the programmer in the top left. The programmer will typically do two things. They're going to write their normal application code, maybe 1,000 lines of JavaScript code. They're also going to write down their package.json file. And then that will be fed into the dependency solver, npm. And then that will then solve the dependencies for the programmer and produce, in this example, like 67,000 lines of code. Those will all get linked in to then build the final product, um, which the programmer can then uh, deploy in production. OK, so we have this um, order of magnitude, or two orders of magnitude difference between the amount of code the programmer writes and the amount of code that the dependency solver solves for and manages. And um, in addition, we also have this um, sort of interesting fact that the specifics of the dependency solver can affect the solution that we get back. Right? So one dependency solver um, might give back this solution. This might be like NPM's um, default solver might give back the solution. But if you change and use like yarn one or yarn two instead, it might give you back a different solution. And you, know, you might have some more exotic dependency solver, which gives you back another solution. Right? And none of these solutions are necessarily right or wrong compared to the other. They're just different choices. Okay? So this begs the question, why do dependency solvers choose what they choose? What are the space of acceptable solutions that they can produce? Right? Um, and among the, among the space of acceptable solutions, how does the solver prioritize different solutions? Right? And we'll see later on in the talk that different package managers actually behave differently. Right? And I think this is a really important um, thing to understand because of the amount of volume that the package manager and dependency solver um, deals with is, is so much larger than what the programmer will typically write. So actually, the choices that it makes has a large impact on the semantics of the final program. Um, right? And in addition, we can also think about, well, not only do semantics vary across um, package managers, but, but, but can programmers be actually, can they actually be given more control here? All right, so that, that's sort of the introduction. I'm now going to um, break this talk into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about um, Paxol, which is a general space of dependency solving semantics that I've developed, along with a corresponding actual solver implementation for this. Um, second, I'm going to discuss uh, min npm, which is a drop in replacement for npm, but it um, gives the programmer access to flexible solving semantics for NPM, and then these are solved via Paxil. And lastly, I'm going to compare um, the, the performance and the solution quality of min NPM and standard NPM. All right, so let's, let's start with Paxil. So here I'm really going to try and lay out first a mathematical um, semantics for what is dependency solving. All right. So what, what does a dependency solver take as input? OK, well, a dependency solver, it receives the package.json that these are writes, as well as the current state of the entire like, package ecosystem, right? which um, contains dependency information and so on for a ton of different packages. Okay. And what does this data really look like at its core? Well, 
the package.json defines what I'm going to call the project root node in blue on the, in the top left. And there, the programmer listed out their dependencies um, in, in a format um, rather like this. And then from the package ecosystem, we have a bunch of packages. And each package has a bunch of different published versions. And each of those published versions um, has a list of dependencies in, in the same format. Okay. Now let's break down the data types a little bit more here. All right, so what, what do we really have here? Well, in, in all of the package managers that I've seen, we have um, package names, you know, like A and B and so on. We also have versions for each of these. And lastly, we also have version constraints, um, which you can specify when you write down your dependencies. All right, let's think about what, what types of data these really are. Well, um, in the package managers that I'm familiar with, at least, I would love to see counter examples. That would be interesting. But package names are usually just strings. They, they are strings which uniquely identify a package. But versions um, and version constraints, these are a little bit more complicated. So we all know that like um, Semver is a very common standard for version numbering. But you know, there may be non-Semver um, package managers. And in, and in addition to Semver, there are some subtleties that come up with how you handle pre-releases and so on in, in um, semantic versioning. So really, the, the type of versions may be different than just the sort of standard uh, a.b.c, right? Um, so I'm actually going to say that versions have some abstract type um, curly v, right? We don't know that ahead of time. And then likewise, the language in which you can write down version constraints, this varies from package manager to package manager. Um, so I'm going to call this abstract type of version version constraint version constraints. I'm going to call this curly C. Okay. So now let's let's summarize all of that um, and take a look at what are the inputs to a sort of general semantics of dependency solving, sort of as a first cut. Well, to know what it means to solve dependencies, we need to know the domain of version. So that's curly V. We need curly C, the domain of version constraints. Um, that's what I went through on the previous slide. But we also need to know how do those two connect. We need to know um, how do you interpret a given version constraint from curly C. So we have a uh, we need a satisfaction predicate, which I'll call sat, which takes as input a version constraint and a version, and then turns a bool saying whether or not the version satisfies the constraint. Okay. And then lastly, you need the actual dependency data, so the data of all the package.json and the ecosystem and so on. And those will be um, written down in terms of V and C. OK. So that's the inputs to a sort of hypothetical sort of general dependency solver. What are the outputs? What does it produce? Well, it produces a directed graph of nodes, where the nodes can be either the project root node, sort of a special node, or the package version nodes, Okay, where edges indicate resolved dependencies. Okay. So what does it mean, though, for a solution graph to be correct? Okay. What is the idea of correctness here? Well, the idea is that the edges um, of a solution graph like this should be in direct sort of bijection with the listed dependencies of that node. And the, um, the destination vertex of an edge, the version of a destination vertex, should satisfy the listed version constraint in the dependency from the source node, right? And that is being judged by this sort of arbitrary um, given uh, satisfaction predicate, OK? So if, if a um, solution graph um, satisfies these criteria, then I'm going to call such a solution graph as satisfying, OK? So pictorially, we have the space of like all the sort of random solution graphs and then inside of that, we have a much smaller subset of solution graphs which are satisfying. Intuitively, these are solution graphs which actually give back the packages that the user asked for and that the dependencies then sort of recursively asked for. OK. But is this enough? Are all satisfying solution graphs OK in the world of packet management? Let's take a look at this solution graph. Um, let's suppose that this solution graph is satisfying. Is it going to be acceptable? Well, actually, NPM will say, yes, this is a great solution graph. Cool. 
But PIP will say that this is invalid. In fact, PIP will never produce this solution graph. Why? Because it has two copies of B with different version numbers, okay? which is a conflict. OK, so um, to model the fact that different package managers actually behave differently with regards to conflicts, we need to add a little bit more um, input to a sort of general dependency solver. So it's the same, same stuff um, from before, but down at the bottom now, I've added in a new consistency predicate, as I call it, which I'll call um, consistent. Okay, And this consistent function, it takes as input two versions, and it's going to return true if it's OK for those versions to be co-installable. OK, so let's actually look, some at, look through some examples of this consistency predicate, because I think it's pretty interesting. OK, so pip. Um, so pip will not let you co-install any versions of the same package. OK, so the consistency predicate for pip will take in a v and a v prime, and it's going to return true only if those are actually identical versions. OK, on the other hand, we have npm. npm lets you co-install anything. So it's going to always return true. This is just a like, constant um, function. OK, and then somewhere in the middle, we have what Cargo does, which is um, somewhat subtle, right? So Cargo actually will let you co-install two versions if they are not Semver compatible. Okay? So that's what the consistency predicate is there. OK, so pictorially now we have the space of all the solution graphs. We have satisfying solution graphs, and we have consistent solution graphs. And a uh, correct package manager should only ever return solution graphs that fall in their intersection. Okay, But there are potentially a lot of solution graphs which fall in this intersection. So how does a package manager, or a dependency solver, I should say, how does it choose which one, which solution? OK, so the majority of um, package managers, and I think we'll see SPAC shortly after this as an exception, um, a majority of package managers um, do sort of a greedy sort of top-down um, optimization. OK, so if we have the two graphs on the left and the right, um, most package managers, like NPM, for example, are going to prefer to choose the, the graph on the left. Okay, why? Because they actually just um, sort of build up the graph um, sort of um, lazily by sort of traversing the ecosystem. Okay, and they're going to first say, "Oh, I could choose either a 2.0.2 or a 2.0.1." Okay, and they're going to prefer to choose a 2.0.2 because it's newer than 2.0.1. OK, but then after they've done that, then they will sort of recursively traverse. And then they might end up with older versions of B. OK, um, and as long as um, there are no conflicts, they won't backtrack. OK, um, so, so that, that's sort of how most package managers perform um, this sort of like greedy optimization here. Um, in contrast with Paxsolve, what I actually want to do is I want to actually try to optimize globally. Um, so. Paxsolve will actually let you be able to sort of optimize uh, uh, globally, so it could actually choose the solution on the right, for example. All right. So let's summarize uh, sort of where we are with the inputs that Paxsolve receives. So the inputs are, what are the data types for versions? What are the data types version constraints? Um, you need to actually say the actual dependency data pulled from package.json files. right? And then you also need to say, how do these sort of arbitrary, type, arbitrary types connect? Well, we need a satisfaction predicate to connect con constraints and versions. We need a consistency predicate to say what versions are co-installable. And then um, I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but we also uh, can also accept in some arbitrary uh, optimization objectives. Okay. And as an output, Paxsolve will give you back a solution graph. And of course, that'll be in the formats of the arbitrary types um, v and, and c. All right, so, so that's um, sort of the, the mathematical uh, sort of foundations behind, behind Paxsolve. Let's take a look at uh, my implementation for it. So the implementation um, actually implements this sort of general model. So you can actually give Paxsolve any queries, and those queries can actually contain um, whatever data types of versions and constraints and so on that you specify. And in its query, you also have to give it these, these um, sat, um, sat and consistent functions, which I talked about. Okay? And 
then it will solve it and give you back a graph. And this whole solver is implemented in Rosette. Um, so for those of you who don't know Rosette, well, you can follow this link to find out more. But the gist is that it, it, it extends the racket language with so-called solver-aided programming. Essentially, you can write mostly normal-looking racket code. But the racket code can operate on symbolic values. And then these symbolic values are then translated down to solution variables in Z3 and then solved for automatically. OK. Um, so my implementation follows six steps. So PackSolve will first generate a symbolic solution graph G based on all the given dependency data. Then it will constrain G to be satisfying. It will constrain G to be consistent. It will optionally constrain G to be acyclic, which only some package managers want, such as Carco. Uh, it will then evaluate symbolically the optimization objectives, and then uh, that will do the work of translating down to Z3 and solving for me. Great. So let's take a look at the symbolic graph generation. OK, so um, if, if, for example, the project root depends on packages A and B, well, we don't need um, symbolic um, indexes into A and B. We know that it depends on A and B exactly. And likewise, suppose that um, package A, both versions depend on B. Well, they depend sort of non-symbolically on B. Right. But we don't know which versions they should depend on. Right? Those have to be solved for. And those are added in by symbolic indexing. So I have this sort of like uh, two-level uh, indexing, um, indexing setup where the first level of indexes are sort of non-symbolic indexes into the, into the graph um, grouped by packages. And then the second level of indexes are these symbolic integers. Okay. And then lastly, um, when we generate this graph, we generate a a bool for a symbolic boolean for each of, for every node in the graph that says whether it should be included or not, right? Because we need to keep track of which which uh, which nodes are actually included in the final solution, right? And this uh, you can write this down in, in bracket code quite easily, um, which looks like this. Okay, great. Then after this, we have to constrain G to be satisfied. So I'm going to blow through this because I'm running short on time. But first, we have to constrain the project root to be included. That's the first assert line, right? Then we can actually loop over every edge, OK? Then we can check if the source is included, and this is now a symbolic operation, right? Then we have to satisfy a bunch of stuff about the dependencies, which is the rest of the code here, right? We index um, to get the destination node using this like two-level indexing, right? And this index is you know, partly symbolic, as I said. And then lastly, we have to uh, once we get the destination node, which is symbolic, we have to constrain the destination node to properly satisfy the dependency, and it has to be included as well. Okay. We also constrain G, G to be consistent via simply a sort of pairwise adding on consistency constraints. All right. And then lastly, we e lastly we evaluate symbolic optimization objectives. So um, the user can um, provide in these optimization objectives. For example, here uh, each each node has a cost of one if it's been included. Otherwise, it has a cost of zero. And then we can, for example, sum these up and compute the, the total sum. And then and that'll be a cost function that we can minimize. All right, so that's the implementation of PackSolve. Um, let me talk through min NPM, min NPM really fast. So min, min NPM is a drop-in replacement for NPM. You can use it just in place of how you would do NPM install. It's totally compatible in terms of creating a compatible node modules directory and so on. And um, the idea here is that you can also then provide sort of user-given uh, optimization and consistency flags via, via the command line. So you could say what minimization criteria you want um, when, you, when you do min npm install. And, and this is all implemented by just sort of um, shipping queries off to Paxsolve, which is, which is the backend. Great. Let me blow through the evaluation, and then I think it'll be time for questions. Right. Um, so, at this stage, we want to see a few things. We want to see that solves are successful and they don't break existing code. We want to see if our optimization objectives actually find like meaningful optimization opportunities. And we want to see how slow the solving time is. Right. So first of all, um, to show that min npm actually produces like valid solves, we ran npm and min, min npm on a small created data set of about 10 JavaScript projects. And then 
after solving them with npm and min npm, we can then run unit tests and hey, guess what? The unit test did actually pass under min npm, which is really cool. Um, then to go more large scale, we ran min npm on a data set of the top thousand most downloaded packages. And then for each package, we see how often we fail. Min npm only fails on 60 of those thousand packages. NPM failed on 34 of those. Okay. Second, uh, how fast is, is min, min npm to use? Like how fast does it actually solve? Well, it was about faster than NPM on about half of the packages, but we do have some really bad outliers that we do need to take care of. Okay, so it's about 10 at slower than NPM on about 2% of the packages, 2.5% of the packages. And we have some work that we can do to sort of improve the solving speed. Um, so to take a look at sort of a truncated um, CDF where we sort of excluded the outliers, um, we can see that about half, uh, about half of the time we are a bit faster than NPM, um, but we do have a, a long tail where we are two, four, six, eight times slower than, than NPM. Okay. Um, do we actually get to minimize well in practice? So on this data set of top 1,000 packages, um, we were able to um, configure min NPM to minimize the total number of dependencies. Okay, And of those 1,000 packages, it improved about 10% of those packages compared to what NPM would do. And on some, we had some huge improvements. Um, for some packages, we were able to solve with um, 25 times fewer dependencies compared to what NPM does. So let me show this pictorially. So here we have a plot. Each plot is one of the 1,000 packages. The x-axis is the number of dependencies when NPM solves it. The y-axis is the number of dependencies when min NPM solves it. So we want everything to be below the line, uh, which is when min, when min NPM produces a smaller solution. And we can see that actually you do get a good number of points that are below the line. And we get absolutely nothing above the line, which shows that our Sure, theoretical guarantees of minimization actually do hold up. Great. Um, so for our conclusion, we have different packet managers in the world. They all have different semantics. They have different domains of how you can write down constraints. They have different semantics of allowable solutions, and they have different semantics of optimization. Uh, most packet managers, they don't have uh, much support for allowing programmers to control the semantics from the outside and control what to optimize for. And most package managers only optimize creatively. Um, now, PackSolve, it, it endeavors to be a backend solver, which could handle the different semantics of many different package managers. So far, it works for NPM. And um, the, one of the key contributions here is we can actually surface object, um, optimization, optimization, excuse me, optimization objective settings to the programmer so they can control what to optimize for. And min NPM is a instantiation of this for NPM. Um, which, which works as a drop-in replacement for, for NPM. Um, I think this is my last slide. Um, we have a wide variety of interesting optimization objectives to choose from that we can experiment with. So we want to try to probably choose fewer old versions of packages. We can try to minimize total dependencies, but we can also, instead of doing that, we can minimize duplicated dependencies, like uh, minimize the number of co-installed um, versions of the same package. And we can also go for some more, um, I don't know, non-standard optimization objectives where we also optimize for like total code size, right? Because we can know the total kilobytes per package version and so on. Um, so there's a lot of uh, room here to explore still. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, you can um, check out our website. Um, so I don't have anything on this website yet, minnpm.github.io, but as I sort of um, you know, finish um, Polishing up the solver and uh, and you know making it more stable and stuff. I will publish um, more information onto this onto this website and feel free to reach out to me via socials that are listed on my on my webpage. So thank you everyone and I'll be happy to take questions now. Ah oh, damn it! It doesn't let me do that. <laughs> well, well, I don't think we have time for. Questions, Donald. Okay. We went a little over time. I need to go a little bit over. Yes. Nonetheless, I see some very interesting question in Element. So if you, if you could go in there and respond to them, that would be great. Um, yeah, I will do that um, offline. Uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for your talk. <laughs>